Strange Wills. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William and featuring Marvin Miller and John Conroy with Howard Culver and an all-star Hollywood cast. Original music by Del Castillo. Dead men's wills are often strange. We cannot attempt to understand them or try to find the answers. We can but tell the story. This is Warren William bringing you the story, The Killer and the Saint. But first... And now, The Killer and the Saint, starring Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. Two brothers met for the first time in three years, met on the brink of an open grave in a windswept cemetery. A cold, driving snow almost obliterated the little handful of mourners. At the head of the grave stood the minister intoning the prayers for the dead. To his right was Don Cohen, son of the deceased. He stood alone, head bowed, his face etched in sorrow. Across the open grave were two other men. One, somber, heavy set, paid no attention to the service. The man next to him, his bared head covered with snow, was David Cohen, also a son of the deceased. As the services neared the end, ashes to ashes, Dust to dust. May the soul of the deceased Michael Kerwin be consigned to the ever loving arms of the Savior. Amen. Mind if I say a few words to my brother? I haven't seen him in three years. Can't see nothing wrong in that. But the cuffs stay on, sonny boy. Okay, but keep him covered up. No use letting everybody know. Come on, let's go. Hiya, Don. Hello, David. Glad you could make it. Well, I'll be... You two guys look enough alike to be... Wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. We're brothers. Identical twins. You don't have to tell me, kid. Like two peas in a pod. Well, start talking. I'll give you just five minutes. Too bad about Dad, David. Yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't have come sooner. Maybe it's just as well. Dad got suspicious toward the end. Didn't believe that California vacation story anymore. You didn't tell him where I really was, did you? No, of course not. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Well, Don, I'm coming up for parole next month. Looks like I'll make it, too. Parole? Oh, yes, of course. I've had enough. Three long years of it. And, uh, and if you make it, what do you intend to do, David? Well, I don't know yet. That depends on Phyllis. David, I, uh... Well, go on. Speak your piece. What's up? I just wanted to tell you, Phyllis knows. Phyllis knows I've been... I had to tell her, David. I, I had to. Did you tell her why? No, no, I couldn't. Why not? Because I'm in love with her, too, David, just like you are. I see. You didn't lose any time, did you, Don? Now, wait a minute, David. You've got it all wrong. What do you mean? Well, it's just taken her this long to find out that she loves me, I guess. I see. I see. But don't worry, David. After you get out, I'm going to take care of you, just as I promised. Take care of me? What a laugh. You sure done a good job of that up to now. Look, I've uh, got to go now. Phyllis is at home waiting for me. She's got a cold. Couldn't make the funeral. Okay, pal. No hard feelings. You're still my brother. 
although I sometimes wonder. Write to me at the bank, David. I'll have everything ready for you when you get out. You better, chum. I'm going to need it. About a week passed before Don Cohen came to my office to talk over his father's estate. I found him to be generous with his inheritance. Exceedingly generous. I know Father cut David out of his estate, Mr. O'Connell, but uh, I want to give him half anyway. Well, Don, you certainly are generous about it. Well, David's being cut off was partly my fault, I guess. Dad asked me where David was, and uh, I finally told him. Yes, I know. That was when your father asked me to change his will, naming you sole beneficiary. Well, David's had a lot of bad breaks. If he gets half of what Father left, he'll be able to go somewhere else and start over. What about Phyllis? Weren't they engaged before this all happened? Yes, that's right. But during the three years David's been gone, she, she's had a chance to think things over. She's not going to marry him now. You, you can't blame her. Maybe not. Well, maybe she's right. I might as well tell you now. You're bound to hear about it later. What's that, Don? Uh, Phyllis and I are going to be married next month. After his release from prison, David Cohen never came to my office to collect the inheritance Don had set aside for him. He'd dropped out of sight completely, but not out of action. One night at the First Street Bank and Trust Company... The alarm! The alarm's ringing! Looks like a light coming from the vault. Yeah, the vault door's open. Somebody's coming out. Hey, you, stop! Stop or I'll shoot! All right, you ask for it! Missed him. I missed him. Police Commissioner Doolittle almost bit his cigar in two when he heard the news. There was no doubt who the robber was. His method of cracking a safe was unique in crime annals. Don called me early the next morning and asked me to go with him to the commissioner's office. They wanted to ask him some questions about his brother. Shortly after 10 o'clock... It beats the very devil. This David Kerwin's out of stir just one week and he cracks his safe for $50,000. I thought you told me he was going straight, Don. He promised to, Commissioner. But how are you so sure it was David, Commissioner? After all, there are plenty of other crooks who could have done the job. Yeah, that's where you're wrong, John. Cracking a bank safe today is almost an impossibility. This fellow is a throwback to the Jimmy Valentine technique. He can break a time lock and open a safe by listening to the tumblers. His fingers are super sensitive. There's magic in them, black magic. You mean to say, Commissioner, that just by turning the dials on a vault door and listening to the tumblers, a man is able to actually open the vault? That's right, John. I'm convinced this fellow David Kerwin can open any lock in the world if you just give him time. I don't know what makes my brother do these things, Commissioner, except that he might have injured his brain when he was a boy. He was thrown from a horse, had a pretty nasty spill. Yeah, well, in any event, he's got to get cut. There isn't a bank in the country that's safe as long as he's on the loose. Yes, gentlemen, David Kerwin must be captured, dead or alive. <laughs> But capturing David Kerwin was easier said than done. Within a month's time, three additional banks reported that their vaults had been opened and robbed, and in each case, the same delicate technique of this master cracksman had been used. A modern Jimmy Valentine was on the loose, just as Commissioner Doolittle had said. The city was in an uproar. In the midst of this turmoil, Phyllis and Don were making arrangements to proceed with their wedding. You know, Don... I don't feel right about going ahead and getting married just when... I tell you, darling, there's no sense in us waiting. Things like this will just go on as long as David is at large. We can't let him ruin our lives, too, Phyllis. But I can't understand it. It, it doesn't make sense. What doesn't make sense? Well, when David and I were going together, he was always so nice. We talked for hours about all the plans he had. He was going to take up medicine, be a surgeon... And now... You can't blame him, Phyllis. I told you what caused it, that fall from the horse. But that happened years ago. 
Why should he all of a sudden? I don't know. That's up to the psychiatrist to figure out. But I tell you this. I've washed my hands of the whole mess. It's just lucky that everyone in town understands. Otherwise, my job at the bank wouldn't be worth very much. If only I could do something. The best thing you can do for him and for me, too, is to forget him, honey. Just forget him. Forget him? Don, listen to me. I love you very, very much. But after all, I loved him, too. But that's over, past. It may be over and past, Don. But I'll never be able to completely forget him. You understand, don't you? Don wasn't able to completely forget him either. After all, David was his twin brother. Late that night, Don drove out into the country. He stopped in front of an old farmhouse and walked up to the door. Who's there? It's me, Don. Leave the lights out, David. I've only got a minute. Did you bring the stuff? Yes, here it is. Guaranteed to change a brunette into a blonde in three hours. Be careful, don't drop it. I got it. Say, aren't you taking a chance coming out here? Respectable banker visits hideout of criminal brother, you know. So what, you're still my brother, aren't you? Uh, everything ready for tomorrow night? Yes, everything's set, David. I got you a passport, birth certificate. How'd you arrange it? Well, they belong to a former customer that died. Found them with some papers at the bank. What's my new name? Arthur Penish. Arthur Penish, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, I better be getting used to it as long as I'm going to use it from now on. And here's the money, David, $10,000 in cash. That should hold you for a while. Thanks, Don. When you get to Rio, get lost. That's all I've got to say. Just keep out of the limelight and you'll be in the clear. No worry, I will. Of course, it goes without saying, David, that uh, both Phyllis and I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, skip it. Okay, I, I won't mention it again. You might do me one more favor, though. What? I... Well, I thought perhaps I might see Phyllis just once more. See Phyllis? Why, uh... Why don't you just forget about her, David? You, you know she can't afford being seen with you. Well, couldn't you have her someplace where I could just sort of drive by and look at her? That's not asking too much, is it? You, uh... You, you still in love with her, David? Of course I am. Okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. Tomorrow's the end of the month. I have to work late at the bank. Yeah, but how's that? I'll have her at the bank, say, at midnight, and you can drive by and see her through the window. Just drive by, huh? That's not much of a break after you all. You gripe me, David. Here I am, trying everything I can to... Well, all right, if you insist. Listen, here's what we'll do. I'm listening. I'll open the front door just at midnight. That's the time the watchman's making his rounds on the second floor. That'll give you just five minutes alone with Phyllis. That's all I want, Don. Five minutes. After that, you beat it back here. Pick up your passport and money and then get going for the airport. Your plane leaves at three o'clock. Okay? Okay. See you tomorrow night, Don. I'll be there just when the clock is striking twelve. Two of The Killer and the Saint, written by Ken Crepine and directed by Robert Webster Light, follows in just a moment. First, here is a word from your announcer.
of The Killer and the Saint, starring Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. At the bank the next morning, Don was summoned to the office of the manager. Mr. Gainsworthy lost no time in coming to the point. Well, Don, you're just about the best insurance we have around here. I'm afraid I don't understand, Mr. Gainsworthy. Well, with you working here as cashier, I think your brother wouldn't want to embarrass you by, well, by breaking into our vault. I hope that the police catch him soon, Mr. Gainsworthy. It's been very hard. No, 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 no. Think nothing of it. Both of you brothers came from a very respectable family. That's the way life is sometimes. But no one is going to blame you, Don. Well, I hope not, but you know how people are. Your family isn't a bit different than dozens of others. One black sheep. Well, what family hasn't got a skeleton to rattle? I suppose if you go back far enough, you'll find a killer and a saint in every family tree. Maybe you're right. But what I called you in for was to tell you about the vault. The vault? Uh, anything wrong? Quite with... the contrary. Last night, we installed a gas bomb. You know, tear gas bomb inside the vault, just as an added precaution. Oh, I see. Then if the vault should be open during the night... That's it... right. A stream of tear gas comes out the minute the time lock is touched. No one could stay inside that vault very long. Well, that sounds like a very good idea, Mr. Gainsworth. And without a mask, any robber staying in the vault for more than five minutes would be dead. I understand. He wouldn't have time to get much cash, would he? <laughs> time... I'll say he wouldn't. He'd come running out of there like the very devil. Yes, sir, I'd certainly feel very sorry for your brother David if he tried to rob our bank. Later that night, Don and Phyllis were preparing for the visit of their midnight cavalier. No detail had been overlooked. Shortly before midnight... David, darling. Shut the door, David. Hurry, we have so little time to be together. Oh, I've been dreaming of this minute for three years. Three long years. Oh, don't well, talk, David. Don't talk. Please, take me in your arms. Oh. You don't know how happy I am, David. I have a lot to tell you, Phyllis. Things to get off my chest. No, no, not now, not now. Later you can. Oh, and later may be too late. David, David, dear, let's not stand here by the door. Someone may go past the bank and see us. Where can we go? Let's walk back. Don left the vault door open. We can't be seen there. Uh, always the thoughtful brother. Huh? Come on. Here. Here's the vault. Won't Don object to my having you all to myself? That's not like him. Let's not spoil a perfect night, David. Please, let's not talk about him now. Hurry. Hurry and go into the vault. All right. There's a light switch just to the right of the room. Turn it on, please. To the right of the room? Wait. Oh, there. It's on. Don! Don! Yes, fellas, I'm coming. Don, I've done it. I've done it. I've locked David in the vault. David in the vault. Oh, there, there. <laughs> Darling, don't cry. But I feel like... I feel like a Judas letting him kiss me and then... We had to do it, Phyllis. It was the only way. But why don't you call the police? Why don't you get him out? He'll smother in there. He'll, he'll die. Wouldn't it be better for all of us if he did, darling? Don Kerwin, what do you mean? Just what I said. My brother's an incurable convict. As long as he lives, we'll have a shadow over us, a blot on our happiness. Do you mean to stand there and say you deliberately had me trick him into walking into the vault so that... so that he would die? Yes, I did, Phyllis. I'm afraid I don't understand you, Don. Surely you don't mean what you're saying. Even if I didn't mean it, I couldn't get him out alive. Why not? When you lock the vault door, you automatically set the time lock, too. It can't be opened until 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. The time lock? Yes, fellas. If anyone tries to open the safe, it would be automatically set off a tear gas bomb inside the vault. The gas would kill David in five minutes. You... you murderer! Ah, fellas... Get away! Don't touch me! I never knew I could loathe anybody as much as I, I... Go on. I'm not going to sit idly by and watch David suffer. 
Get out of my way. Get out. I'm going to call the police commissioner. They'll get him out. And believe me, if David dies, I'll see that you're charged with, with murder. So you really love him that much? Well, I should have known. All right, fellas, sit down and be quiet. What are you going to do? Make that telephone call to the commissioner. Probably the only decent thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> I'm certainly glad I was with you when that call came in, Commissioner. I wouldn't have missed this for anything. David Cohen, notorious bank robber, captured by twin brother. Lucky there was one good one in the family. Wonder how he ever tricked him into the vault. We'll soon find out. Come on, John, let's get in that bank. There they are. Well done. Good work. How'd you manage it? Phyllis did it. Hey, hey, young lady. You certainly got a nice reward coming for this night's work. I don't want any reward. I just want you to get him out alive. How about it, Don? Can't you open the safe? You work here. It's not as easy as all that, Commissioner. The time lock is on. Set for eight in the morning. And by then he'll be dead. Suffocated. Oh, do something, Commissioner. Do something. Can't we break the time lock? Dynamite it? Or... It's impossible. You see, Commissioner, a gas bomb was installed yesterday. The minute the dial on the time lock is turned, it sets off the bomb inside the vault. It would kill him in five minutes. Isn't there someone in the city who could get him out alive? There are only two men in the world who could possibly get him out alive. And even then, it's doubtful. Two men, you say? Who are they? Jimmy Valentine, the top cracksman of all time. And who's the other, Don? Who do you think? <laughs> Warren William will be back in just a moment to bring you the dramatic climax of The Killer and the Saint. First, here is a brief message from your sponsor. Now back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in The Killer and the Saint. During the next few minutes, I witnessed one of the most extraordinary sights I've ever seen in my life. The bank was filled with police who'd come in response to the radio call. All of us watched, spellbound by what was transpiring, not daring to believe our eyes. Phyllis. Yes? Well, how about it? It's up to you. No, Don. It's up to you. Knowing what I do now, I never could marry you. This way, I can at least respect you. All right, that's all I wanted to know. Now, everybody stand still and shut up. I've only got a few minutes. I must have absolute quiet. But, Don, you don't know anything about cracking a safe. You, you kill him. Listen, save your talking until later. I wouldn't give you a plugged nickel for his chances, but I'm going to try. Let him alone, Commissioner. Something's just dawning on me. Dawning on you? No, no, it can't be. You're crazy. That This guy can't get him out. But I think he can, Commissioner. I think he can. Shut up, I said. Okay, hand me the emery paper. Here it is, Dan. Here it is. You see, Commissioner, he's sensitizing his fingertips. Sensitize? Let him work. He's turned the dial on the time lock. That means he's got only... Only five minutes to go. Quiet. I've got to hear. Sixteen left. Four right. No, no, it's five right. Seventy-two left. Eighteen right. Oh, hurry, Don, hurry. Only three more minutes to go. It's coming, it's coming. We're watching a genius, Commissioner. Emory paper, quick. I, I think I've missed. Here. Uh, Sixty-seven left. Eight, eight. Uh, the tumblers won't fall. The tumblers won't fall. Eight. Eight. Huh, it's off. Time lock is off. How much time have I? Less than a minute, Dan. Only 55 seconds. I know this combination. 14 left. 67 right. 
92 left, one right. Hurry, Don. Hurry, open the door. The five minutes are gone. Here it comes. He's alive. Oh, thank God, David is still alive. Later, I went to Commissioner Doolittle's office where Don told his story. It was just as I'd suspected. David took the rap for me because I was Dad's favorite son. He knew that if I had gone to prison, it would have killed the old man. But, Don, after David's release, how did you keep the other robberies from him? Didn't he know what was going on? I got him a hideout in the country. It was easy. No telephone, no radio. He didn't know about anything. When did you decide to kill him, Don? When Phyllis told me she still loved him. Then your plan to get him out of the country was phony. Is that it? Yes. I realized too late that getting him away wouldn't help me with Phyllis. That no matter where he went, her heart would go with him. Uh, Knowing these things, Don, just why did you change your mind? Why did you let us know that you were really the master criminal? Well, with Phyllis, it was double or nothing. Your double or nothing, eh, Don? That's right. And my double won. Most of the money stolen from the banks was found and restitution made. Don Kerwin was given a five-year sentence, and from the latest reports is a model prisoner. Commissioner Doolittle and I both agree that Don is one of those rare individuals who gets an insatiable pleasure out of opening locks, a second Jimmy Valentine. After he serves his time, I intend to see if I can't help in his rehabilitation by getting him a job with a bank vault manufacturer. If anyone can design a burglar-proof vault, I know that Don Kerwin can. Phyllis and David are married and living in another part of the country. With both of the Kerwin twins out of circulation, ho hum, it's a boring life. Next week, I have a story to tell you about one of the greatest, most fantastic characters who ever lived on the Barbary Coast. His name was Horseshoe Harry, and history has it that he never turned down a dishonest dollar or helped a damsel in distress. But a girl came into his life, a young and beautiful, accomplished pianist. She went to work in Horseshoe Harry's Emporium, and because of her, he ordered the finest piano that money could buy, a Bechstein concert grand that came all the way from Berlin. This piano played a never-to-be-forgotten role in both their lives. It brought them together, separated them. And then, finally... The day before the San Francisco earthquake, well, (laughs) listen to the story we call Portsmouth Square for the most beautifully realistic story ever heard on this Strange Will series. This is Warren William inviting you to join us again next week. Strange Wills is a Telaways feature produced in Hollywood. Names, places, and events have all been changed so that no reflection may fall on any person or persons living or dead. (laughs) ¶¶